Our aim is to introduce readers to contemporary Muslim sages as role models. To this end, we have profiled 20th and 21st century sages from a diversity of cultures who have had a profound impact on their societies and the world at large. And one of the most colorful of these great men and women was the Turkish sage Muzaffar Ozak Efendi. My guest today from Spain is Sidi Amin al Zueta, uh, a writer, lecturer, and translator specializing in Islam, Sufism, languages, history, and philosophy. Amin is also a student of the teachings of Muzaffar Ozak Efendi, and I, I'm proud to say that he's my friend. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, Sidi. Yeah. So uh, to begin to kick this off, uh, the discussion, um, what was your impression of the uh, of the text? Uh, you've reviewed the text, uh, the the book. Um, uh, what 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 was your what what did, how did you feel about that? I mean, yeah, it is a uh, it is a very personal biography. Musafir mm -hmm. um, Effendi wrote uh, a small autobiography of himself, oh. which was published uh, as an introduction for the book The Unveiling of Love, which is one of his books yes. that he wrote. Yeah. Uh, he had, of course, many books in, in Turkish, but this book he wrote in Turkish, but for an American audience when he was mm. visiting America in the, yeah. in the 80s. Right. And uh, um, also there are other things written about him. For example, recently there is a biography of him written in Spanish, <laughs> curiously, mm -hmm. uh, by, in Argentina. Very good. Now, this is a, a very personal in the sense that uh, Shems uh, Friedlander is not only talking about himself for Effendi, he's also talking about himself in relationship with himself yes. for Effendi. Yeah. So it is a memory uh, not only of the, of, of the master, but also of the kind of connection that uh, the master had with his disciples right. embodied in his own experiences. Yeah. And there is no attempt, uh, also because of the brevity of the text, which is part of the characteristics of this collection, to be very exhaustive in terms of yeah. chronological biography. So it's more like a collection of snapshots, so right. to speak, that uh, create an overall uh, picture of Mustafa Effendi. It's also a narrative of, the, of, a, of a certain time in history as well, which I, I was time. very struck by. I want to actually, uh, before we go any further, I want to read a passage from the book uh, I, I was very taken by the by Shams has a, a very particular style uh, that he, he uses, which is is quite beautiful and, and lyrical in a way. Uh, in talking about his early years, I mean this was um, this was his his teacher, uh, his first the, the first teacher of uh, Muzaffar Ozak, Sami Effendi. Um, so, if you just bear with me for a minute. Um, the last wish of Muzaffar's father was that his son be given the guidance of a sheikh who could direct him in religion and faith. All his learning and the guidance he received came through the shuyukh. At the age of six, his father's friend and schoolmate, Sayyid Sheikh Abdurrahman Samiye Sar Sar Saruhani, uh, known as Sami Effendi, oversaw his education until he was 18 years old. Sami Effendi was affiliated with the Qadri, Lakshbandi, Ushaki, and Halveti dervish orders and had written over 20 books on Islamic law and Sufism in Turkish and Arabic, as well as Ilahis and unpublished manuscripts on chemistry, alchemy, and herbal medicines. Whom he was close, when he was close to death, Sami Effendi destroyed the unpublished manuscripts on chemistry and alchemy for fear that they would be misused. Muzaffar went to primary school and entered secondary school, but left because of poverty in the family. During this time, he also studied Arabic. By the age of six, Muzaffar could read and write the Quran. At seven, he had memorized most of the surahs. At 10, he was a Hafiz. Haja Aisha's concern for her son grew. She considered sending him to military school where he would be educated 
have a comfortable housing, career, and food every day. One night she had a dream. A holy person approached her and said, Don't allow the boy to be a soldier of men. Make him as a warrior of God. Muzaffar Effendi felt that this holy entity guided him his entire life and inwardly taught him the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad His mother cleaned houses and sold books on the streets to support her household. At the age of 13 or 14, Muzaffar started to work in a leather shop. He had no training in leather work, so he carried goods and raw leather. His demanding boss worked him hard and paid him a pittance. The leather blankets were heavy, and after a time, Muzaffar began to have muscular problems from the lifting and left the job. He traipsed the damp, gray Istanbul streets until he found work in a factory that produced coins and metalwork. His dream was to be an Islamic scholar, so he weighed the advantages of work versus study and chose study. He made the decision to attend the open lessons of famous scholars and studied to be a muazzin. The job offered less money, but he would have more time for his studies. The thing that really strikes me about these passages is, is how deep, and, and it's, this is something that's shared by all of the, the sages that we, that we write about, is how deep the knowledge, you know, his, his, his learning began almost at infancy, practically. I mean, he became a Hafiz of Quran. Mm. And this is something that m many of us miss, especially in, in the modern day. Mm. You know, we, we start practicing Islam or grow up practicing Islam, but then, you know, go to school and uh, jo play sports and mm. do all of these things. Um, whereas most of these people, they had no conventional childhood what we would mm. consider conventional childhood it's mm. they his his um his life was was dedicated to learning from the earliest days mm -hmm. and this and and especially muzaffar effendi because he was so colorful and he was so mm. uh he seemed to in a certain way to be so easy uh mm. and and you know his teaching was in 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 cafes and mm. uh, and 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 restaurants and sure. places like that. Sure. Uh, yeah. This. I mean, if uh, you know this passage that you have read um, about uh, Abdul Rahman Sami Effendi, his yeah. first teacher, who was of course uh, a close friend of his father, and we have to remember that Musafir Effendi was orphaned when yes. he was very young. Yes. His father was a scholar, and. Uh, uh, Abdur, Abdur Rahman Sam Effendi was uh, an extraordinary uh, master. He had certain peculiarities that made him very special. One, right. one of them is that he was one of those shuyukh that uh, are sometimes uh, known as Jami uh, al-Turuq, the gatherer of different tariqas. Right. So he was a master of the ushaki, uh, which, uh, tariqa, which is one of the branches of the halbatiya. But also he had the justice from the Qadriya and the Rifaiya yes. and others. And he has a very famous poem, very famous, famous uh, Ilahi, um, in which at the end of every stanza, he says, for example, we are the Ushakis, and then we are the Qadris, and we are the Rifais, we are the Badawis, we are the... And the, 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 this idea of the Tariqah Muhammadiyah, yes. of all of the Turuk, really, as I was once told by one of the masters here in Turkey, are like uh, the fingers of one hand. Of one hand, yes. They are all connected to one hand. Yeah. So Musafir Effendi uh, breathed that from the very beginning yeah. of, of his life. And then, the, uh, you know, the, you're talking about this uh, uh, thirst for knowledge and this opportunity to get knowledge. But in Musafir Effendi's life, we see that he um, had to strive a lot in order to get knowledge. Yeah. yeah. Because they were very poor. And uh, I mean, this job, for example, in the leather factory, this was not just like a couple of hours. This was sort of the whole day. Yes. And then he went to school, uh, uh, you know, at night, you know, so he had that himma. Yeah. And, uh, and, and also he, uh, which is something very important that uh, I think that sometimes we lose sight uh, in, in the West being so trained uh, in, in, a, in a kind of academic fashion, you know which is that in, in order for knowledge to be beneficial, you have to put it into practice. 
Yes. You know, that that uh, knowledge which is not put into practice, even if you theoretically become a kind of alim, you know, you are not a real alim because the real alim is the one that has embodied that knowledge, has been transformed by that knowledge. Well, Sheikh okay. Ibn, Ibn Habib uh, frames that that idea out is that the people who do what they know, exactly, you know, and 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 this is this is in, inherent. In uh, in every one of the people that we that we profile, the, the, the people who embody what they learned, Absolutely. and uh, they they weren't living in ivory towers. They exactly. were all um, mm. working people. Yes. I mean, yes. every every one of them. Yes. And uh, mm. uh, I I find and also that they all had tremendous challenges, tremendous difficulties, yes. and. Um, I mean, I I don't want to digress too much, but I, I it it reminds me of the times that uh, I was with Sayyid Omar Abdullah, mm. who was an eminent, eminent, very distinguished um, uh, educator, mm. um, and he was um, hired by the because of Prince uh, the, Prince uh, Saud Al Faisal. Uh, ordered the uh, Rabita to to um, to to hire him as a as a kind of a missionary or a, a, mm. a, a, a dai, uh, which he was anyway. And uh, but the way he was treated within that organization was just made, it infuriated me. Mm. He had the, people didn't respect him. He would mm. be left hanging for mm. day after day after day mm. to to collect. 12 months of back salary which they didn't pay you know that sort of thing and he never said anything he was he was pleasant he was and i was you know f you know boiling because i just felt he was not being respected but this is these people they they're they're like that they they're just they're ordinary people in in the scheme of things but they're extraordinary to the people who recognize them uh, yes so um I think that really struck me about his about his life and 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 uh, uh, what he went through. From uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask you, I mean, was you're from Spain. You're not from Turkey. Um, Turkish is a is a is not an easy language to master. Mm -hmm. Most of us mm -hmm. uh, don't or haven't, mm -hmm. uh, and yet you, you were attracted to. Mm -hmm. The teaching of the mm -hmm. Jarrahi. What mm -hmm. what was it that attracted you? What mm -hmm. was the the, mm -hmm. the? Well, it it was not something that uh, I deliberately thought about. Mm -hmm. It was, as they say in Turkish, kismet. It was destiny. Of you course, know, we, yeah, okay. we we yeah. we really. I mean, when when we search, in a way, it's because Allah is 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 searching for us. It's looking right. for us. And so my journey in Turkey, in fact. Um, uh, started on my honeymoon. I, I, I came. <laughs> All right. I came. I came on my honeymoon. I was a Christian, mm. you know, and uh, we had been married at the church and everything like that. Mm. I didn't have any clue about Islam or about Sufism, maybe a little bit of Sufism. Mm. And so we came to Istanbul on our honeymoon because we thought it was an interesting place. Mm. And uh, we were here for several days, and we met uh, some people. We made some friends. One of our friends, uh, who had uh, good English to kind of talk about everyday matters, but not about uh, deeper questions, and I was making him some questions about mosques. And so we went to Ayyub Sultan one day, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, in Ayyub Sultan he saw uh, a clearly Western-looking man praying in the mosque. Mm. So, with characteristic uh, Turkish uh, kind of uh, courage, he went up to him and said, I have this friend from Spain, he's asking me some questions about Islam, and I cannot really answer him, could you talk to him? And, and this person was Sheikh Abu Hakim Murad in, uh. in, in, in uh. <laughs> So, we, we, spent, we spent the three following Allah days Allah. together in Istanbul. Yeah. Allah. And, uh, and I remember that we were living like on a Tuesday. And, uh, you know, Abdul Hakim and his wife, they had been married mm -hmm. uh, recently. They well, went this to, was a long time ago. This, this was a long time ago. Uh, uh, they, they went to the Jarahi, they went to the Jarahi uh, uh, Tekka, and they invited us to go with them. 
Right. Uh, we couldn't go. Uh, if something came up, we couldn't go. But then we continued our friendship. We were living in England. I was teaching at the university in England. Mm. Uh, and then little by little, you know, uh, um, uh, kind of that thread continued and I met Sefer Effendi. So it was not something that I, that I looked for at all. Right. You know, really? but it, it was something that came, you know. And yeah. uh, this is the, I mean, this is the reality of destiny. You know? yeah. And uh, but Sefer Effendi, who was a great, as you know, a, a master storyteller. Yes. You know, he has, uh, for example, a story that I remember now. Um, there was this this man who had a friend, and uh, you know he had uh, lent this friend some money, so he decided that it was time for him to go and call, ask him for the money, you know that uh, he had lent him. So he he went to this other city in order to to get the money, but then on on his way to his friend's house, uh, there was this funeral uh, a prayer, this Janasa prayer. And uh, he decided, okay, I have time, okay, I'll go. And uh, he did the Janasa prayer, and then he went to the graveyard. They were putting him in the graveyard, and then uh, suddenly, you know, the, the 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 shroud was was open, and it's a kind of very colorful story, like some of the ones that Musafir Effendi used to yes. tell. And then he saw that this man, the the, the dead man, he had a lentil, <laughs> you know, he had a lentil in his lips. You know, right. and uh, so you know, he suddenly came into his mind the notion of taking this lentil, you know, and he put it in his mouth, you know, and and then you know suddenly this this mysterious man with a white beard appears, mm. and he doesn't know him, and uh, this white bearded man asks our friend, uh, "Well, why are you here?" He says, well, I came to collect the money that I had lent uh, to this, this friend. I know that's not the reason you were here. Mm. You know, uh, you're you here because that lentil was part of your destiny and mm. you had to fulfill it. You know, so if, if, if the lentil is part of your destiny, then you will get it mm. no matter uh, the way. You know? mm. So this is, this is a, a profound teaching. And, and uh, you know, Robert Frager, who is... Um, uh, yes. famous ecologist who was yes. a, 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 a disciple a disciple of, of Musafir exactly. Effendi he tells us a story at the beginning of one of his books and Musafir Effendi told him this story the first time they met you mm -hmm. know and there was like a kind of lesson for for Robert yeah. Frazier about about embracing this destiny you know? so yeah. that, that that's basically Russia. the reason Russia, Russia. well the, no but there's a great secret in this and it's, <clears> it's also something that young seekers are, are always asking about i'm sure you've been asked is how do you find a guide you know a true guide and so on and this is a subject we've gone over and over and over again which i think we need to do uh because it's 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 people have a, a misconception of what the whole relationship with a, a a guide is is about because they think that the guide does things for them uh, you know that they, but that's not the case. They guide them. They and they, you know, Muli Hashim Balriti, Allah Yarhamu. He he said that the, the, at the beginning, for a novice, the the sheikh or the guide is like a, a mother with a child. You know, they're holding them close, keeping them from doing something stupid, running out in the street, getting run over, or whatever. Um, uh, and uh, um, when they become mature, then all they do is they point them in a direction. They, they just adjust what they, you know, and, and keep them going. And also this idea that you're going to have, you know, some huge illumination is, is not, uh, it's not a foregone conclusion. And people are, this is all from Allah. It's what Mustafa al-Badui said to me, uh, that, um, uh, you know, people have to remember this is not about people, it's mm. about Allah. Mm. So we, we, we memorialize people like Muzaffar Effendi because of the beauty of their character and because they're role models for us, mm. not because they're magical figures or mythological uh, beings that uh, have miracles and... and we don't know, you know, we, we, can't, we can't tell these things.
but I mean, uh, you, I don't think you ever met. Uh, no, I never, I uh, never met him suffer Effendi. Yeah, he passed uh, away in 1985. Yeah. But you but met Tur uh, I met uh, Suffer Effendi. And, so then, and right, then Turul right. Effendi, who passed away, yeah. uh, Allah who recently. And both of them were his uh, Muri yeah. su successors. Yeah. I think that Musafa Effendi, uh, in the context of this collection and in general, you know, he is a, an especially attractive figure because yeah. I, I think of him as a kind of Barsakh. You know, when mm -hmm. when when uh, you come to Istanbul, a lot of people experience this. You know, Istanbul is unique among all of the cities in yeah. the world because it's the only city which is placed. Uh, upon two continents, mm -hmm. you know, and the Bosphorus is a kind of Barsakh, literally, yeah. between Europe and Asia, you know, and uh, very much in that manner, uh, Musafir Effendi was a Barsakh between different worlds, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, one of these, uh, let's say, uh, uh, meeting of two worlds came from the fact that, um, and we have to remember that uh, Musafir Effendi was born in 1916, now, then comes at the Turk. Then the Tekas are closed. are closed in 1925. The madrasas mm -hmm. are closed. Uh, people don't know that for some time in Turkey, it was illegal to give the adhan in Arabic. You know, yes. it, it was done in Turkish. Can you imagine? You know, that? I am aware. You know, and uh, this was in the 40s. You know, so this was an in uh, incredible upheaval. You know, yeah. and so Musafir Efendi, really, his father. His first teacher that you mentioned, they come from this great Ottoman uh, tradition, right? You know, a, a tradition which is a tradition of uh, incredible scholarship, right. which joins not only the religious science, it joins the religious and the intellectual sciences. Mm -hmm. This was very much part of the Ottoman system of education, yeah. you know, and then it joins that with the with the, with the, with the, the spiritual path. So Istanbul was the city of madrasas, and it was also the city of Sufi Tekas. Now he comes from that, and then suddenly all of that is closed, and uh, uh, Turkey begins a completely different phase. And yet Musafir Efendi is one of the people that carries this this light, this torch, into yeah. this new age, you know. Yeah. And um, so when all of the Tekas were closed, uh, it was common, for example, to 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 quote uh, the stanza yeah. of Anilahi. You know that yeah. said the lamps in the sky, meaning the stars, are the lamps of the Tekka, You know, and the Tekka is the whole earth. In yeah. other words, even if you close the Tekkas, that's not yeah. the important thing. Yeah. The important thing is the meaning of the Tekka, and we will carry on this meaning. Yes. So th this is the first kind of uh, encounter, you know, between two words. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, secondly, um, Musafir Effendi, he was um, a great alim, who. Um, we have to remember, and, and Shems uh, Friedlander mentions this in the book, he was a khatib, an imam, in many mosques in Istanbul. Yeah. Uh, during Ramadan, for many, many years, he was the, uh, the, 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 the khatib in Suleimania, Suleimania Mosque, yes. which is the, you know, the greatest mosque in Istanbul. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very respected. And yet, at the same time, he's a bookseller who likes yeah. hanging out in, uh, you know, in the cafes, mm -hmm. meeting all people's people from all walks of life, you know. Yeah. So he again he joins this scholarly world yeah. with the world of everyday people. Well, also one of the mm. touching things in the mm. story uh, that I, I published uh, on uh, uh, our our dear beloved friend Hafiz Ismail yes. was when he and his his uh, cohorts were in a in a nargila place, having smoke, you know, smoking nargila. Uh, they went to pay the bill and it had been paid and they said well who paid it and they said well he does he's not here now but he usually comes every every evening and exactly. that's how he met Muzaffar Effendi Muzaffar he, he paid the bill exactly. for his, exactly. and brought him in and reeled him in very slowly because exactly. he, he, he it took him year many years before he could actually mm. you know kind of mm. uh, submit to the, the, the you know the, this teaching Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's very human. I, the one I I I really love many aspect parts of this story. I mean, he talks about um, going up into the mountains, and uh, Muzaffar Effendi makes them eat huge amounts of meat. Yes, and you know it's it's almost bizarre. You know that yes, he, yes. he did that, but 
Yes. But um, he he created these ama amazing people. I mean, Tosin Bayrak, who yes. we both knew, yes. Allah Yerhamu, um, who was uh, Muzaffar Effendi's Khalifa, he figures in in the narrative in in places. Um, but he was he was a, an outrageous character when he was younger, and something happened with when he met Muzaffar Effendi, which utterly transformed him. He was. A completely, you know, I mean, he still had that Jalal quality. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a he was a shock artist in New York, mm -hmm. and exactly. and yet he exactly. and had this co really colorful background, mm -hmm. and yet all he all that happened was he he was in the presence of Muzaffar uh, Effendi, and it just changed his entire life. Yes, yes, and uh, exactly. That uh, doesn't doesn't. Bayrak was an extraordinary personality, Amazing. and it was only yesterday that I was talking to a friend who was a murid of Tosun Baba, in fact. Yeah. and uh, he has this project of making a film about him, which would be an, uh, an extraordinary yeah, well, film, well, because well, yes, it, his yes. life is really yes, cinematographic, yes. Absolutely, you know, cinematographic absolutely. life. But uh, yeah, Tosun Bayrak has also, as you know, an autobiography, and, and uh, he, yes. he, he he tells the his encounter with Musafir Effendi, which is yes, quite extraordinary. Yes, Maybe we can remember it here, you know, because yeah. it's, so. Um, I mean, Tosunbaira comes from a family which is kind of secular uh, mm -hmm. family in Turkey. Uh, which, but they but they spoke Ottoman Turkish. His yeah, father I mean, was, he was, was he was he was very well connected, but uh, he he didn't receive a kind of religious upbringing. Yes, um, I mean, he used to pray with his grandmother, I think, or something like that, you know. But no, nothing else, you know. Yeah. So so he goes to the West. He studies art in Paris and London. Then he goes to Berkeley. Then he gets interested in in spirituality, and he goes through the Gurdjieff uh, yes, uh, yes. way, you know. And, uh, and then uh, he comes to Turkey, he meets one uh, aristocratic lady who was arranging like kind of soirees in, in, yeah. in Istanbul. And then he talks to him about Musafir Efendi. He goes to visit Musafir Efendi in the mm. Tekka in Karagümrük. Now at the time, the Tekka is closed. It's, mm. uh, you know, officially they are banned. But still, uh, Musafir Efendi is meeting there with the Murids and they're kind of closed doors. Mm. So he is there in the presence of or Musafir Effendi, and uh, he sits there, and then Musafir Effendi says, he recites a line of a poem by Yunus mm. you know, in which says something that uh, you wanted peaches, and yet you climbed a walnut tree. <laughs> You know, and and so it's it was a kind of riddle, you know. And then yeah. Musafir Effendi had never met Tosun Bayrak. Suddenly he says, "But there is a professor of art here. He was a professor of art right. that thinks he knows the answer." You know, and then yeah. Tosun Bayrak says, "At this moment, I felt like everything. You know, my degrees, my fame, this and that." Fell completely off me. Yes, you know, I was connected to my to my essence, and yeah. he became my murid straight yes, away, yes, and completely yes. transformed. So, yes. Mustafa Effendi, and I mean, I've never met him personally, but uh, uh, his successors very much had that. You know, yeah. had this ability, you know, to connect to your essence and yeah. to show it to you. Yes. You know, and uh, so. Um, that well, that's an extraordinary power of the of the of the great masters. Yes, I mean w one of the things that I think is great about this book is this. You know, Shams Friedlander is is um, is really one of our best um, representatives uh, for in the West of Islam, and his books have been very popular. The, Indeed, and and. Uh, and he has he ha he has such a beautiful um, being himself, and he's one of the last surviving followers of Muzaffar Effendi. Now uh, Shams yes. is yes. is eighty two, mm -hmm. and uh, unfortunately he couldn't be here uh, for, for health reasons. But um, his his this this book is his his. Um, Hopefully not his last book, but it's 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 one of the the final books that he will have have written, and he really put his heart and soul into it, and um, it's it's a unique glimpse into into the relationship, his relationship with uh, with Muzaffar Effendi, and and with and and a relationship with 
a teacher or a guide. Um, he, it's it, uh, it's it's very intimate and 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 not sentimental at all. No, uh, it's, 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 for leather is yeah, never sentimental. Yeah, but um, also the other thing I wanted to to, to bring out is, is Shams is, in my opinion, one of the really great photographers, Muslim photographers uh, today. Uh, I mean, he's his photography is phenomenal and i think it's I what it makes it makes the the book so un, you know beautiful i mean there are other fo photographs in the book but i mean this this is i think a classic photograph mm. of muzaffar effendi on a boat and he describes the uh, he describes it i mean he's just a, he's a man who relishes Mm. life you know he taught mm. people to enjoy life mm. but remember Allah mm. and and this is something that has been coming back to me recently I mean uh, my my teacher Muli Hashim Balghiti he said do whatever you like but you will regret every instant that you don't remember God that you don't remember Allah right. and uh, and Muzaffar Effendi was was that person who was constantly reminding people in restaurants, on the streets, in ho in private homes, yes. in the mosque, all the time to remember Allah. Mm -hmm. And in, in a time that was very very difficult, mm -hmm. uh, I would mm -hmm. think. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes. I mean, one one of his uh, teachings, one of his sentences that uh, are often repeated in mm -hmm. the tariqah, You know, it's mm -hmm. like. Uh, would be like in, in translation something like your your hand with the benefit and your heart with the beloved so in other mm -hmm. words you're working you're fulfilling your responsibilities in life you're doing that mm -hmm. but at the same time you are in this constant remembrance of god yeah you know so um so if if, if you saw that person uh, at, at this particular moment you would think well i mean he's just an ordinary person he's an ordinary bookseller mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if, if you have the eye to perceive mm. uh, what is uh, behind and that's manifest in a subtle way in all of his movements, you know, mm. in all of his words, then you would see that he is doing that, but with a particular intention and a particular state, mm. you know. So, yeah. No, but what you're saying about uh, Shem's uh, uh, as, as, as a photographer and also as a writer is very, yeah. is very important. I think that he's. Uh, um, photographs you know that the, there was this very famous uh, French photographer whom many people consider the greatest photographer C of the C 20th Cartier century Bresson. Henri Cartier-Bresson and uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson he used to carry around one very small uh, camera right to catch what he cons what he named the decisive moment yeah. the decisive instant so it, it was not about people posing, you know, it was not about that, you know. Mm. It was a mo about catching a moment of life. Mm. And I think that uh, Shems' uh, photographs have this quality. Mm -hmm. You know, what what he catches is what uh, Sufis call al-waqt, al yes. the moment, the yeah. instant. You yeah. know? And uh, his photographs of the uh, world in dervishes, his photographs inside the teka when, yeah. when, when, the, when the dervishes are doing dhikr, is not just a, a, you know a representation of people doing the court, but actually it catches the moment of the state. Yes, the in, sanctified, the moment. sanctified moment, yes, the yes. state that they are experiencing. Absolutely, you know? and that is very very difficult. Yeah. Well, as we were just with Shams uh, yes. uh, an hour or so ago, yes. and I, I brought this up to him, and I said, "Why didn't you? You could have been a photographer." Mm. And he said something very interesting, which I hadn't thought because he's a he was. Uh, as a, a, a profession, he was a graphic designer, and he was a designer for CBS Records and, you know, Look Magazine, mainstream publications and, and uh, companies. And uh, he said, I was always surrounded by great photographers, the best photographers mm. around who were, you know, I was designing their work, mm. so he never felt... Uh, um, uh, I think that he that he needed to get into into yes. that, but he he has a 
a gift that I've I've seen very very rarely with any photographer. Indeed, indeed, and and, and also I mean it, it's not only that he had the gift, also he had access to things. Yes, you know which are also difficult to, yeah. to come by. Yeah, I mean, you, you can mm. contrast him mm. with my dear, beloved mm. friend, Peter Sanders, who, mm. who was, has been working on this project with me. And uh, P Peter is, is, is a photographer who, who takes, he poses people. I mean, he takes people, he doesn't pose them, he doesn't force them, but he's, he's very still, you know. Uh, whereas Shams is someone who's he, he photographs action, yes. which is just breathtaking. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I I have one of his, I have several mm -hmm. of his photographs, mm -hmm. and you know, the, there are a couple in here that are just, you know, they're they're masterpieces as far as I'm concerned. Yes. They catch something so unique, yes. and the, and you won't, and these places that the, what he's captured you won't ever find ever again. No, you won't. You won't. It's, it's, and uh, you were saying that he catches movement, you know, mm. but uh, there is the idea and, uh, you know, the present uh, Sheikh of the Jarrah Tarif Ahmed Defendi yes. was talking, um, last time I was here in Istanbul in September, was talking about this, you know, he, he, he was saying, I mean, w when you look at uh, um, electricity, you know, yeah. the light, it seems to you that it's continuous. Right. But in fact, it is discontinuous. It's made out of photons. You know? Yes. Uh, he says reality is the same, you know, because yeah. Allah is creating the world at every instant. You know, this is that she did al khalq You know, so in this capturing of movement, he's also capturing the stillness be between yeah. two movements. Yes. Yeah. Mm. And the great thing about Shams is I think he's he's aware of this. It's not just an intuitive thing. He's kind of a, you know he re he really is aware of that almost metaphysic of of light and and capturing light and shadow and I think he uh, brings uh, he brings yeah. to his work yeah. his uh, spiritual realization. Yeah. You know so and and also you say uh, you know about uh, his writing uh, um uh, he has a very uh, special way of writing. Yeah, very, very, very special unique, way of yeah. writing. Very unique, uh, and not yeah. everybody's used to this kind of writing. Yeah. But uh, something interesting about it is that if you really think about it, um, because he writes uh, sometimes as a kind of collage, you know. Yes. So it's like one snapshot here, and then right. In, in uh, it, it not it's not it's like kind of discontinuous writing. Right. And of course, in this book, for example, uh, there is a kind of chronological biography of Mustafa Effendi, but sometimes he jumps. Yes. He jumps ahead or he jumps back, you know? Yes. Uh, yeah. But really, this is a way of writing which was, it is very characteristic of the Sufi tradition. We, we should remember yes. that. Yes. So, yes. for example, if we look at uh, the Mesnevi by Madlana Rumi, we, w we won't find there a kind of treatise. You know? Yes, yes. No, we will find stories and then stories nested in stories yeah. and then. Uh, you know, he's dig digressing in, in, into something else, or Sadi's uh, Bustan. It is, it is, uh, and and the Sufis traditionally made a deliberate use of this technique. You well, know, in, in in order in order to let's say go beyond the lineal mind. You yeah. know, we in the West have been so much educated right. in the lineal mind. You know. Well, you know what's very interesting to me, anyway. I was the first time I ever encountered the uh, Quran. I was in an acting company, and they were doing a, um, a production of the Screens by Jean Genet, which was on the Algerian War. And the director distributed uh, passages from the Quran, you know, as background. You know, we were reading Sartre and and, and Genet and. Uh, Franz Fanon and all these, you yes, know, like people, you know, mm. these, and mm. um, uh, but then suddenly I, 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 they, there was a mimeographed, you know, passage of from Surah to Nur, and Surah to Hajj, mm. and the th I didn't understand a word I was reading, you know, mm. I was just reading it, but I was stopped in my tracks because I thought to myself, this is the way we think. We think in fragments. Mm. We're jumping. Our minds are jumping mm. to here and to there, and then there's a river, and then there's a fire, and then there's mm. a, mm. A, a an automobile and a mm. siren and a thought, something from the mm. past. And somehow, I think 
the Sufis have have recap they they their their writing is informed by the Quran as well. Mm -hmm. Is that we the 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 Quran moves from admonition to narrative to praise to you know it exactly. just goes from and it's like a, exactly. an ocean and it's so overwhelming when exactly. when you, this is this is in know, fact one of the things yeah. that. Uh, uh, for example, people who are used to reading the Bible, when when they approach the Quran, they get disconcerted. You know? y yes, because the the Bible is lineal, you know? right, right, and it begins right. at the beginning. You know, right, creation of God, uh, you know, the heavens yeah. and the earth. You know, but what about the Quran? I mean, yeah. the Quran is moving from one thing to another, yeah. and this yeah. and this is this it's offering us uh, an enactment of Tawheed. Right, and because the Tawheed really means to make one. Yes, you know, it's the master of wahada. Is this the second right. verbal form? So it's it's to we are living in in, uh, in in this world and our lives in an experience of apparent disconnection. Yes, but in fact, that's only apparent. Everything is connected. Yes. So the heat is to make that one. So yes. the Quran is offering us, yes, you know, as an experience of reading, that very experience of connection. Yeah, no, no, so. <laughs> I mean, one of the, the the other things that I love about the the end of of this um, of the of the book as well is is uh, Muzaffar Effendi's passing, his death. Um, the way that Shams treats this, uh, it's 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 you know there it's not, it's not an emotional. No. Um, it, it's it, it's a very. Um, I don't know how to say it. Exactly. Well, it has it has emotion, but it is not sentimental. It's not sentimental, and and we we could perhaps reflect about what is the difference between these yeah. two things. But I mean, mm. the last mm. image. This is one of Shams. This is the funeral of Muzaffar. I mean, look at that. To me, it's just it, the, that all the emotion is in that image. You know, this, yes. you know that's a very famous image. Though. It's it's a beautiful image. And Muzaffar Effendi passed in February. Yeah. And uh, and uh, there was a sudden uh, change of weather, very dramatic change of yeah, weather. Yeah. And uh, Turul Effendi, you know, his uh, spiritual successor, uh, has sometimes said that uh, uh, it often happens when a wali passes away yeah. that there is a change of weather. Yeah. yeah and and uh, we, we have to remember, like uh, Dr. Umar Abdullah says, mm -hmm. you know, that, uh, you know, the... the, the, the the animals and, and the plants they are making the cure in unison with the wali of God. Yeah, yeah. So there is a connection. There. Right. And, and uh, I did, going back to to the um, to the beginnings, uh, yes. I, I I'm really was so struck by how deep uh, Muzaffar Effendi's knowledge was and and his yes. discipline. Because he he didn't come off that way. He came off as a bon vivant, you know, someone who, mm. I mean, at least publicly, I, we we I wasn't his his student or anything. Mm. But this idea that he was teaching, you know, on the streets and in the cafes, mm. and they mm. were having great meals, and they mm. would go here mm. and there. Um, mm. Uh, but behind that it was this is this incredible discipline, and in in the whole series, this is what I discovered of, of these mm. people. I mean, they mm. they didn't have ch childhoods in mm. in, the, in that way, and mm. I, I it it really in 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 his case in particular because of the way that he deported himself, and and of course that was there were reasons for that. Uh, given, given the, you know, he, he wore a hat, he wore a brimmed hat, and and you know was was very sometimes he sometimes, he yeah. also wore yes other of things, course yeah. yeah of course but I'm yeah. I'm saying mm. he's he didn't have he didn't look like a conventional sheikh in the, the well it was not, in it, North it, Africa it was not possible to and look it like was that not possible because you know with at the Turk all of those yeah. uh, kind of clothing you yeah. know yeah. Were, 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 was, was were bad you know yes, so exactly. so they they had to look uh, you know yes. like an ordinary yeah. person you know yes. everything he would have look differently you know in yeah. other in other conditions you know? yes of course but of course uh, uh, the, this helped him also I think to his we have to remember that his bookshop was really kind of a place yeah. of pilgrimage you know? yes. and, and yeah. people I mean famously as uh, Shems writes in his book uh, John Bennett uh, you know Gurdjieff's uh, yes. famous disciple he came to visit him in the in the, in the bookshop right. and he said about him that he was one of the true 
the few true spiritual masters yeah. that he had met in his life, you know. And he was also kind of bridge between East and West. Yeah. And of course, uh, an, an, an essential part of his life and an essential part of the book is uh, the, the, the last years of his life, you know. Yes. Beginning in uh, 1978, he became the head of the, the Rahi Order in 1966, I think. Yeah. And uh, in 1978, he goes to France. Right. to this uh, music festival in Rennes, and then he goes to Germany, he goes to the States. Yes, and I, I was, uh, I remember that vividly. I, I didn't, uh, unfortunately, attend right. those events, but I knew about them, and uh, 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 I, 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 had, I, I had to say I had some doubts about, you know, the, the display of these things, but in, in retrospect, I think he did a, a, something well, phenomenal. Well, he, 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 yeah, received, right. he received a spiritual order yeah. to... To do it. To, to bring that to the West. Yes, yes. You know, and uh, he, he received that order um, in Mecca, in fact. He, oh, wow. he made the pilgrimage to Mecca 11 times, the Hajj. And yeah. once he was uh, in, in the, uh, doing tawaf around the Kaaba, mm. and this person appeared... You know, one is reminded of uh, the even mm -hmm. Arabis, you know, his encounters, you know, in, yes. in, in, in uh, by the cover, and this person gives him the good news that he's going to bring Islam and the spiritual path yeah. into the West, and uh, so very soon after, these doors, you know, begin to open, yeah. and so he has he has uh, we could say different purposes, you know, in doing yeah. that. So he he he's bringing uh, Islam into the West. He's building up this uh, uh, these uh, branches of the Jorah Tariqa, you know, in the yeah. West. But he's also um, doing uh, what uh, the Prophet Sallallahu recommended to Muad ibn Jabal when he went to Yemen. You know, m uh, make things easy, don't make them difficult. Yes. Give good news, don't give bad news. So so if if someone is uh, ready to say la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah then that's the first step then when yes. he feels ready to pray then teach him how to pray yes. and then so it's not like delivering a whole package yes. either you take it or leave it yes. no but something gradual and this is the way the sufis yes. always 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 yeah. spread islam well the, you know this mm. was the the case of the naqshbandiya in south africa because the 100,000 people or more by now, many, many tens of thousands of people became Muslim through the efforts of a small community of Naqshbandis in, yes. in South Africa. And, the, you know, initially they tried the conventional approach and t talk about, it, you know, trying to convince people to take on all of Islam and it didn't work. And then uh, Sheikh Yusuf de Costa, who, uh, Allah Yerham, who, who, uh, who, who's, who was supervised this, he said, Let's go back to the beginning of Islam. Excellent. You know, mm. let's go back before mm. they had Salat, before they had, mm. and uh, and I, I witnessed this, and it mm. was so powerful and mm. moving, mm. because it was this essential mm. uh, um, uh, acknowledgement of unity mm. of Allah's mm. presence, mm. and uh, and this is the case, you know, and um, uh, Habib Ahmed Mashur al Haddad. He, his whole way, he said, uh, if I have attained anything, it's because of dawah, not because mm. of ibadah. Mm. And uh, this is more and more uh, because we're coming to a very dark period in, 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 in human existence. It's very important for people mm. for to, 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 to deliver the message, to, to let people know. Mm. And and to be easy about this, mm. you know. I mean, mm. all of these people. Uh, you yeah, know, of course. Yeah. I mean, the the thing, obviously, you know, is that apart from this gradual kind of approach, they embodied these teachings. Exactly. You know? So yeah. so their dawah was was mainly through hal, yeah. through through yeah. their state, through their through inner Turkey, yeah. through the inner realization, yeah. you know. Yeah. So that there was something about the presence, you know. Yes. And yeah. they they tell these stories, like for example, once they. They took Musafir Effendi to this restaurant in New York, uh -huh. and uh, and it was kind of posh restaurant. Not that Musafir Effendi looked for that, but, no. but you know, if it, he he would be comfortable in a posh restaurant and in a little cafe somewhere. You know, yeah. Having he was not attached to this, you know. yeah. and uh, so uh, 
they, they took him there and there were people having dinner there, not Muslims or anything like that. And suddenly he comes in and everybody stands up. He had that, like that regal. Yes, Shams said that. Shams you know, said he regal, walked into a room and exactly. You know, which, which so he had, he was Jalal in that sense. I think he was. You could characterize him as Jalal because the the, the shuyuk that are Jamal very often you you can't you don't even know who they are. Like for example, um, Sidi Muhammad Bukhorshi in Morocco. Yes. Um, Hamza, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, he was t telling me about, he was like air. Yes. You, could, you could, you, and Hamza, the first time he sat, sat with him, he was, you know, someone was, they were making wudu and having tea and everything. Yes. And he said, yes. oh, where's the Sheikh? And they said, he's the one that just washed your hands for you, yes. you know, yes. that sort of thing. He, yes. they, they were very hard. And at sometimes the Sahaba were so luminous that people couldn't tell the difference between the mm. Sahaba and the Rasul. And mm. he and uh, he always walked behind. He always walked behind. And, yeah, the, know, the, there is he, Sultan Walid, uh, yeah. uh, Hazrat Mevlana's yeah. son. Yeah. He, he explains that uh, sheikhs can be yeah. either uh, Jamal or, yeah. have, or having a balance of Jalal and Jamal. Yeah. They are never Jalal. You know, they, 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 there is a yeah. balance between, a bad, but between it's, it's Jamal like, and, yeah. and, and Jalal. Yeah. And, and so, um, uh, Musafir Effendi definitely was one of those. Yeah. But, but everything, you know, Turul Effendi from the Jurahi Tariqa one, he said that everything in the, in the, in the life of the Tariqa and the development of the Tariqa is modeled upon the life of the Prophet So, oh, so if, if you really think about, for example, the Khulafa Rashidin, yeah. This polarity, you find it there, you know, yes. like uh, Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Uthman, yeah. you know, yeah. they were very soft. Yes, they you were. You know, Hazrat Omar and Hazrat Ali, they had the, yeah. they, they were like that. Yeah. But yeah. yet, for example, Hazrat Omar, before becoming a, a, one, a Khalifa, he he was really Jalal. But they say that when he became a Khalifa, people were surprised, you know, well, because be, be, he became soft. So yeah. he had this balance between there, Jalal and Jamal. There's a hadith about Sayyidina Omar. That his his wife was delivering a baby, and he was outside the tent uh, making food for you know. I mean, and this is when he was Khalifa. Yes. You know, I mean. Yes. It, 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 some someone asked me like, "Have you ever met a Jalal?" Because I when I've talked about the people that I've met, they are very beautiful to me. Yes. And so I talk in terms of Jamal. Yes. And someone who I knew had someone who wasn't really wasn't really an authentic uh, mm. teacher, but anyway, he had. But he was also very very uh, uh, un unpleasant. Who could be very unpleasant? Mm. And he said, "Have you ever met someone who's Jalal?" And I knew what he was referring to, but um, sorry, um, he was referring to. Um, someone uh, and I and and I I realized that I I had met people like that, but they were also Jamal. Exactly, that's they're that's, beautiful. That's, but that's, but that's what we were saying. Yes, you know. Um, yes, they and, com they combine both things. Yeah, yeah. Both things. and uh, and you can see this also mm. in some of the photography. Again, mm. uh, Muzaffar Effendi. Here's a photograph of him in his later years. I mean, look how beautiful he is. You know what a beautiful. Beautiful soul, and uh, uh, we're we're lucky. So uh, anyway, I think we've we've we could go on all night, but I think yeah, I think that's just... maybe maybe because you told me before starting that you wanted to talk a little bit about Sohbet and the Vran, and I think maybe yes. maybe we could Let's, finish uh, with that, finish you with know, that. Yeah, with these two things. I mean, the the Sohbet in Turkish, you know, it's uh, it's spiritual conversation and of course it comes from the root of sohbah mm -hmm. companionship so the sheikh uh, teaches through sohbah mm -hmm. doesn't teach it through he doesn't teach through dars through uh, yeah. lessons like in the madrasa so what, what is the difference you know? mm -hmm. the difference is that in the sohbah he is tapping into what is in people's hearts mm -hmm. so the experience of a sohbah is that people feel that their own unspoken questions have been answered. Yeah. So uh, a sohbet is done through inspiration. 
it's not something that you plan and you bring like in in, in lesson notes, you know. Right. And uh, so in in the in, in many tarikas, in the Jarahi tarikah, this is certainly true. Uh, Sohbet is extremely important, along with uh, hizmet, with service. Yes. Uh, and and, yes. and both things are connected because what allows you to be in the presence of the sheikh and mm. to benefit from the sohbet is your service. Yes. And and the service really makes it possible for that. Yeah. Not, uh, for that knowledge that you receive in the software to be digested yes. and, and, and to be and to be fruitful. You know? Well, this is where we come, come to the whole idea of a role model or exemplar, because you don't learn that except through Sahbet. You don't you company, can't keeping company. You can't, you can't, yeah. you can't. It's it's yeah. it's really it's really impossible. Yeah. And uh, of course in the in the Sahbet, this is so also because in the Sahbet it's not only words that are acting, mm. you know, but it's the whole presence of the master. Yeah, yeah. You know, so he's teaching you through his how. Yeah. And, uh, you know, th there there have been sheikhs in the history of Tasawu who didn't yeah. speak. Yes. You know, they, they, yeah. they taught through their glance yes. or yes. just through the presence, you know. Yeah. And, and so even when they speak, there is not only words, mm. but there is something, something else. Mm. I remember there is an anecdote uh, related to Tosun um, Baba, Tosun uh, Baba, someone that I knew um, uh, when he, the first time he met Musafir Effendi, he came to the bookshop, mm -hmm. and Tosun Baba was there. He used to be Musafir Effendi's translator, mm -hmm. and so he sat there, and Tosun Baba said to him, because this person didn't speak Turkish, he said to him, "Just look at him. Look at the way he's speaking on the telephone." <laughs> yeah. So, in that very action yes there was something you know that was conveying there was yes. communicating yeah so the, there is a, a the language of the tongue and there is also listen al hal the, the yeah. language of the state yeah. you know? yes so that is essential and then the, the question with the of the devrang um um i mean the quran speaks about people that remember god sitting standing and on their lying on their sides yeah. you know? And so what traditionally Ahl al-Tasawwuf al-Qawm have done is to really um, uh, formalize ways in which this Quranic injunction can yeah. be done. Yeah. You know, so some of the uh, uh, rituals of the Kurla are sitting. Uh, mm. Some of them are standing, like in forming two lines. Some of them are standing, moving. So the Devram is standing the Kur, but instead of being a hadra like the ones in north africa uh in a circle in which the people don't move uh, i mean there's don't, a movement don't, yes. don't leave their position yeah. in the devran yes there is a movement, movement. Yeah. there is a there is movement so this is all a way to put into practice you know a last yeah. injunction you know in, yeah. in the quran and uh, musafir Effendi, in fact who was a great scholar uh he talked about the connection between these practices that sometimes you know some people find yes, uh, dubious. finds dubious and yeah. suspicious to uh, he, he connects them to to the uh, to the sira because something which is very important to remember is that and i learned this from my teacher dr omar abdullah that uh, the uh, um, abu Huraira famously said you know, he was the, the the Sahaba that transmitted the greatest number of ahadith. You know? Yes. And he said, "I have given you two uh, loads of knowledge. Uh, I, I, I was given two loads of knowledge. I have given you one. If I gave you the other one, you would cut my head off." Mm -hmm. And so there were sayings of the Prophet that were not passed on publicly. Yes. And that uh, the, the people that were prepared for them, you know, uh, received. And then they they appeared in the book of the great imams of Islamic spirituality. One of them, for example, is uh, Imam uh, al sukhrawardi Abu Hafs mm -hmm. al sukhrawardi yeah. in, in Awarif al Ma'arif. And in Awarif al Ma'arif, uh, Imam al sukhrawardi uh, tells, for example, the the story of uh, uh, ja uh, Jafar al Sadiq. Jafar al Sadiq. Um, no, not Jafar Sadiq, sorry. Uh, um, uh, Jafar Sadiq, of course, is one of the descendants of, of, of Ahlul Bayt. But uh, Jafar, Jafar Tajar, you know, mm -hmm. uh, who was uh, among the Sahaba, the, the person that most resembled uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
Mm. And so once the prophet said to him, you are, you are the one that most resembles me. Mm. And he was so happy that he started, you know, turning in yes. an ecstatic way. So yes. Musafir Friend explains, this is the origin of the turning, this is the origin mm. of the word. Mm. No, so it's, it's always something that is rooted in the Quran and is yeah. rooted in the Sunnah, not yeah. as people imagine. Right. You know? Well, this is very clear and you can mm. see the, the adherence, the strict adherence that all of the sages, Absolutely. Of the authentic sages of Absolutely. Islam have toward this book and the Sunnah. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I was reading last night uh, from the letters of Sheikh Tarkawi, and uh, uh, he, he made a, you know, he admonished his people never to pray alone. To mm. always and uh, you know I, I it, it struck me because I'm I'm very lazy and mm. so I've started going today I went out to mm. to pray and my my mosque is, mm. is right around the corner I could go mm. but you know you, you know, I'm, I say I'm old and he said this mm. is these are no there's no excuse mm. for that mm. and these are what the shiyu you mm. know you get down to it they don't talk about mysteries they don't mm. talk about miracles they talk mm. about following the sunnah yeah. and the, and the there, there is a there is a there's an anecdote with Sefer Effendi who was mm -hmm. Musafir Effendi's successor yes, yeah. when he went to America and they went to open the, the, the official inauguration of the uh, in in yeah, New, New York, York yes yes in Chestnut, Chestnut Avenue there, yeah. you know? and uh, so there was someone um, because I mean Musafir Effendi brought Islam to, to the west and some people you know, got some things and they went their own funny ways, you know, and, and yeah. they, they didn't bear it out, you know. And uh, uh, so one person asked uh, Sefer Effendi, you know, in this kind of uh, dreamy. slight dreamy way, yeah. Yeah. How, uh, how do we get closer to Hazrat Tibdur Nuruddin al-Jurrahi, the founder of the Jurrahi order? And Sefer Effendi, who, who had this characteristic speech of the Prophet, you know, al -Kilam, you know the, the, mm -hmm. he said, Kitab wa Sunnah. Yeah. And that's it. That's it. That's it. So, I think on that note, on that note, so that's, a, that's a nice that's note to finish. The, uh, that's, that's <laughs> it. That says everything. Thank you very much for oh, joining no. uh, this discussion. I hope it was of some uh, benefit to, to any of you. And uh, if you, if it sparks your interest, please, uh, uh, try to get hold of a copy of this through Makkah Books. It's it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, collection, and we're very proud of it. And we're we're uh, we're humbled by the response and by by the act the act of actually trying to put it together was really really challenging. And uh, Allah got us through through this. Uh, thank you, thank you. I mean, Thank you.